Today's video is sponsored by Native Sons Goods, makers of premium quality guitar, bag, and camera straps, handmade in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Check out their website to order your own custom creation and play in style. And remember, when you support my sponsors, you support this channel, and I sure appreciate it. What you're going to hear about today is nothing short of a miracle. It's dramatically new. It's an RCA Victor exclusive, made possible only through years of research, invention, and innovation. Living stereo played on a record through the all new two in one RCA Victor stereo orthophonic high fidelity Victrolas. Hello everybody, Brad the Guitologist here. In this video, we're gonna continue the service and restoration on this 1958 RCA stereo orthophonic console. And in this video, we're going to focus mainly on the amplifier and the refurbishment of the amplifier. So if that sounds like something you're interested in, stick around. Okay, here we are with this RCA amplifier out on the bench. Um, remember, this model had no tuner in it, so it's just the amplifier that we're going to service. I have found another um, LP record player to put in this unit. I gave the customer a quote. A lot of the parts on the a uh, turntable that this thing came with were really cracked. It just became too expensive. All the parts and everything together. So that's a no-go. She just wants to be able to use it. So we're gonna, we are going to overhaul this amplifier and replace the turntable with something more modern. Recall the 5Y3 was red plating when we first fired it up. So I look to probably have a bad 5Y3 at the very least. We're probably going to have all bad uh, filter capacitors as well, especially this one. Now this was supposed to be the first year for stereo uh, for RCA. And I think for any company in general, 1958 was about the first year that stereo came out. It's single-ended stereo output. We have two completely separate channels um, beginning with a 6CG7 on both sides and then we go into a uh, bass control and then a loudness control and another 6CG7 uh, yet another 6CG7 so we have three per side, is that correct? Or well, a stage of the six, six CG sevens have two triodes in each uh, in each one. So, you know, we have one, two, three of those tubes, and then two of the output tubes, which is what we're showing on the the physical specimen in front of us. And you see the chassis number right there, RS one seventy one. Um, this is one of the output transformers, and that one up there is the other output transformer. Okay, we have an external RCA speaker jack. We have a an in, labeled internal quarter inch speaker jack. And we have a switch here for internal and external or internal only. But the thing is, are these wires here are the ones supplying the uh, speakers. Okay, here's our four. Here's our four speakers. We have a, a couple of three and a half inch, um, and a couple of twelve inch speakers. These are not hooked up in stereo, though. The speakers that are inside this unit are all hooked up uh, in mono. They're hooked up in parallel, so there's there's no stereo operation here, as in a left and a right channel. So I'm puzzled a bit. Here's the phono cartridge, signal comes in, and then to this, in stereo. Um, so we have one that shoots off up to here, to this switch. I guess it comes out of here when it's switched properly and heads onto this first stage here, into the into this channel. And then you have this, the same thing, but on this channel down here. This, so this is the right channel. Once you get to the output is when it starts to get a little bit funky because all right these are cathode bias and they they share a sim they share a common bypass capacitor and uh, cathode resistor both of these sides they have some negative feedback here as well on both channels okay so yeah essentially what's happening here with this switching it looks like is after the output transformers the signal gets mixed together 
into a mono signal and is put out through um, the internal speakers when you have the selector switch switched to internal speakers only. Uh, when you have the selector switch switched to internal and external speakers, what happens is uh, the signal from the left channel gets sent to this jack, which is this RCA jack. Right there, that RCA one. So that would would allow you to run like an external uh, cabinet, you know, with a per, presumably another set of identical speakers, um, you know, like this, and then you would set it on the uh, kind of the other side of the room. Two separate and distinct soundtracks. One from one side of the orchestra for one speaker system. Another track from the other side of the orchestra for the second speaker system. RCA Victor will offer amplifiers, stereo pickups, speaker cabinets, and the necessary leads to permit a simple and inexpensive conversion. And the way they're getting around this is they're actually, um, when you switch this, it also switches uh, the output impedance on, on the transformer. It's switching the, uh, uh, the output taps for these. So that they can, you know, mix it together and match impedance. And then this jack, uh, let's see, listening jack for the right channel speakers only. This this other jack right here, the quarter inch, that's for like a headphone jack, but it's only for one side. It won't let you listen in stereo. Mainly what I'm going to do is um, recap this thing and get it operational. And then we're going to turn our attention to the doing all the... Bluetooth modifications. I think first things first, uh, given my recent experience with tubes, I think I'm gonna pull the, all of these tubes and just test them. Okay, here's my vintage precision apparatus company tube tester, model 612, made in Elmhurst, New York. So you wanna take any bets on the 5Y3's state? Let's try the 5Y3 first. Um, and what you got to do on this, to this particular tester, and a lot of testers are like this, you have to um, scroll with this wheel and find the settings. There, I was right on it. Okay, A is 1, so what we do is we find the section that's labeled A. We switch it to 1, it's already switched to 1. Uh, B is 6. Uh, C is 18. D is 2, so you want D to be thrown at 2, and you want F to be 4, so F right here, 4, and you can test filament continuity, well I mean just by looking at it glow, but you can also uh, throw 8 to test, see there's a test position right here when it's on you can throw 8 to test and it will tell you whether or not it's continuous with a little indicator light. Now that's going to test one of the plates uh, right here you see plate 1 is tested with F on 4. Uh, plate 2 we will come back and test with F at 6. Let's test the first plate. So okay there's a line adjustment right here you can see I can adjust uh, but you're supposed to get, if you look on here, adjust line, and you're supposed to put it right between these two little arrows to start. So you wait for it to warm up. Okay, see when I throw the test, the light comes on. That's for filament continuity. So my filament's continuous on, on this tube. Uh, if I want to read it, or I hit the read button. Okay, so surprisingly, astoundingly, shockingly, this tube tests good on that particular plate, so let's switch it. So I'll put six here, and that this will test the other plate. Hell, the other plate's even better than that one. It is getting a little warm. And for the record, this tube is dated um, the 11th week of 1958, so this would be a an original tube for this amplifier. So. 
I would say we've got some shorted um, it's a it's a miracle that this thing is not burned it's a bloody miracle I think it was trying to kill it but it didn't it did not succeed in any way shape or form So yeah, this is a good tube, at least according to the tester. Now that's the thing about tube testers, they're not 100% accurate. They don't, you know, they're not testing tubes at the voltages that are present in the amplifier. So you, you know, they've got their limitations. You, you shouldn't, that's why I'm, you know, I'm usually real reluctant to even bust this thing out because it, it doesn't tell me a whole lot, uh, to be honest, at the end of the day. Um, it can tell me whether, it can catch some shorts and things like that, um, which it can be valuable. But I've found, you know, I don't know, the amplifier makes almost as good of a tube tester in a lot of cases as as this thing, at least. I know there are other more advanced and more modern testers that would tell you a lot more information, but, you know, they kind of suffer from their own limitations, too. All right, 6v6, we have uh, A is number one once again, uh, B is seven, C is eight, D is two, uh, F is three, four, and five. And the filament continuity test is seven. Okay, so let's fire this one up. And again, we will line adjust it to center. Let it warm up a second or two. I can already see the filament's good. And I could test it right now by throwing seven. And I get a short check. So the filament's good. But yeah, you know, for those of you guys who are asking about... Um, uh, you know tube testers and why I didn't just test the tubes and stuff last time I, I don't know that's just kind of been my methodology and my sort of experience that I've come to rely upon uh, the thing is when you're dealing with those um, when you're dealing with more modern amps and those marshals and, and stuff like that um, it's a little bit different and it probably is a really good idea to go ahead and do that it's just that with the vintage amps that I usually see and I usually work on, like such as this one that's on the desk now, um, you know, my usual methods work just fine. So, uh, but let's test this one out and see if what it reads. Reading very good on this one. Very good indeed. So let's check the other one. So so far so good on tubes. Um, 17th week of 1958 on this so I was right this is a 1958 amplifier this one's also 17th week of 58 on this 6v6 and these are all the original RCA tubes it's nice to have all your original RCA tubes and the RCA uh, amplifier from the first year of uh, stereophonic sound I think that just makes these really interesting, you know, the fact that these are uh, the first year that RCA came out with their stereo orthophonic sound, so that these would play the the new microgroove stereo records. It it really represents a leap forward in the technology uh, of the day. It's kind of like you know the leap from uh, from tapes and vinyl to CD or from CD to MP3. You know, it's, it's really that kind of leap. So this, you know, this really represents the cusp of that, the leading edge. Uh, we can go ahead and throw the filament, which we already know anyway, because I can see it glowing. All right. Yeah, this one's deflecting up around above 70 as well. And it even climbs a little bit when you hold it. If it was weak or bad, it would not do that. It wouldn't climb. It would... It would go up and then kind of go, oh, for fuck's sake, you know, and <laughs> kind of back back down. But no, this one uh, seems fine. I'm going to go ahead and spray this socket just to be. These sockets all need to be really retentioned, especially this, this nine pin is kind of worn, but I might even 
need to replace it at some point. 6CG7, triode number 1, 1714, so 1, 7, 10, 4, and 6 and 7. Now this is a replacement. This is a Sylvania tube. <clears throat> I don't need to throw the filament switch because I can see them both burning in there. Yeah, this one's very good as well. Way above 70. It's above 75 actually on this tester, which is which is a good, very good reading. Okay, let's test the other triode. So uh, that's going to be 1 and 2. Man, that one's even better. That one's upward of 80. So that's a good tube. I can see both filaments, I think. Yeah, both filaments are glowing nicely. This one's got a 1958 17th week date code. It'll be interesting to see what the date code on this one is because... You know, it, like I said, it's a replacement. It'd be neat to see how long it lasted. Uh, I don't know. I can't read this code. This is a Sylvania code, so it's got some letters. I'm not sure on that one. This one's testing somewhat well. It's coming up now. A little more. It's creeping up. At least it's going the right direction. But this is still easily a good tube. Yeah, see it's creeping. It's creeping its way up. I think it's just not warmed up completely yet. Uh, let's try the uh, let's try the other triode. Did I do that right? Yep, six and seven. Well, that trial barely deflected it at all. Uh, creeps up when you hold the button, but it would probably operate just fine. Considering it's one of the original tubes, I'm going to leave it as is for now. But I'll make the customer aware that, you know, she might need to replace this one sometime in the... Well, I mean, yeah, this thing's creeping on up there, so... I think it's going to be fine. Okay, this one has the identical date code, 1958, 17th week, as the last tube. It'll be interesting to see uh, where this one measures in relation to the last one. Okay, first triode. Wow. Almost broke the tester with that one. It's better than that. It's good. So that's all the tubes. Tubes are fine. Uh, we had the one little questionable one. Uh, but surprisingly, that 5Y3 is perfect, perfectly good. So, all right, let's move on to some caps. Okay, so here's the underside of this chassis, and you can kind of see what I'm going to be up against here. There's uh, a bunch of paper and wax capacitors. That's what all of these are. Um, every one of these guys are all paper and wax. We've got uh, not one, but two can capacitors to deal with. And one of them, particularly this one, is highly suspect. Oh, it's got, see, this one's got crud coming out of it. You can usually tell a bad one when it, when it starts doing that right there. You see all that crud coming out of that? That's physical leakage. That's like the kind of thing you would see on a bad battery. That's, uh, this is definitely a bad capacitor and it's very likely shorted to ground. And that's why uh, uh, that's why that 5Y3 was gl glowing cherry red, I'm sure. And if it's not shorted, it's probably you know turning itself into a resistor. Uh, but again, there's a there's a can capacitor over here that's just got tons of crap on it. That one's going to be a fun one to get to. I might have to cut those off of here and restuff them because of how cramped it is inside of this chassis. I might have to come up with some way to mount them up here on top. Okay, so let's uh, let's change some caps. Let's get this thing done. One other thing I see right away is that this 
This big resistor right here is cracked, so we're gonna have to change that one for sure. If nothing else, see that big crack on that resistor. And I'm going to spot check probably most of these resistors. There aren't, there aren't even that many of them, so I might as well go ahead and check at least the critical ones, the ones on the power supply and the plate resistors. Here are our tools. Now some of these some of these capacitors are probably going to be oddball values. I've already seen a couple of oddball values. This is not one of them. This is a .022. So this one shouldn't be a problem. And the one beside it I don't think is going to be a problem either. I think it's also .022. What you got to really be careful about in a chassis like this is when you are um, done clipping these out and everything you move so many other components to get to get two things that sometimes you can accidentally ground things out against one another so you have to be careful that you don't do any of that okay so they're the first two out <clears throat> so that's easy enough we have one uh, those are both 022s and they were going from there to ground and there to ground and I'm gonna go ahead and cut these two out as well these are 047s We'll get these out of the way too. May as well. Okay, so let's get the new caps. Okay, so in this instance, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to stick my leads through and I'm going to use the other side of the lead as a uh, terminal. So I'm just going to, well this one I'm not going to do that, but on the other side I'm going to use it as a ground terminal by just making a little circu circle. And I'll add some, add some solder to this lead. Not too worried about it looking pretty. We just need to get this done and get it out to the customer. She's been waiting on it for a little while. Of course, I want to do the job right, but I, uh, I'm not going to be real persnickety about the cosmetics of what we're doing here. So, The only fault I have found with these particular capacitors and I get these from Antique Electronic Supply. I get a lot of people ask where I buy my capacitors. And that's where I get them from. The only problems that I've experienced with this particular uh, type of capacitor, these generic red ones, is that sometimes if you're not careful with the, the legs, um, you know, if you kind of over, if you kind of over tension them or if you work them too much, sometimes they have a tendency to kind of snap off on you. Which is a, uh, which is a bit of pain of a pain in the butt when you've already got one halfway in and it snaps off. But it happens very rarely. I think it's only happened maybe three times in all the time I've been using these, which is years. So it's just something, something you got to be aware of if you're going to use these. Okay, so there are the first four capacitors in there. Let's move on to these big ones right here. These might actually be okay, but I'm going to replace them anyway. And then I've got, I've got one down here. So this is a very well sealed capacitor, so it's probably not been exposed to any 
moisture internally or anything like that, I would say it's probably still a good capacitor. Yep. Yeah, it's perfectly fine. I'm just going to reinsert it. And this other one too right here, this other white one, I may leave as well because it's probably also fine. You know, it says good right on it. It says good all. <laughs> It's better safe than sorry. You do all this, you change a lot of these resistors, and then you leave one, and you get one bad thing, and then you're tracking down problems. I'd rather just replace them all and have it work. Yeah, see, this is the same. So we're good on that. No problems there. Okay. <clears throat> So there are those two. We said these are okay and can stay. These right here need to go. These are weird values, 0.27. They can be replaced with a 0.2 if we have anything new in a 0.2, and I think we do. Yeah, we do. I'm gonna leave enough lead to, uh, once again, hook the new one in it would probably be wise while I have this particular one out of the way to go ahead and spot check a couple of these resistors here all right so let's check a few of these this one is it's a yellow multiplier 242k I think that's right it's 3.6k that's about right yeah, 470K, that's right. This one is a 47, yep, 5.2K, that's not too far off. That one, that one will work. Let's see what we got here. These resistors seem to be okay. We got a 27, uh, 270K, okay. Uh, right here we have a 1, 2, uh, 120k yep dead on uh, here we have another 120k yep pretty good there another 120k these are all probably plate resistors yep 115k there that's good dead on uh, this one is a one uh, green yeah 1.5k that's correct yeah these resistors are dead on um, I'm gonna go to these big bigger ones let's go ahead and do these while we have some things out of the way oh actually what do we have here a hundred we have a hundred K close enough a little bit low it's within tolerance though Let's see, we've got four seven. Can that be right? Now that's damn near dead short. That's almost no resistance at all. I mean, I suppose something else could be shorted elsewhere. There's a lot of stuff coming off of that. And the worst nightmare here is gonna be these uh, couplets over here. We have two of them. I'll show you what I mean. See that right there? that RCA couplet with all those black uh, coated wires coming off of it there's one right there and there's one right behind it those two right there are gonna be a pain in the ass if it turns out that something within those is uh, is off because uh, tracking that down is just gonna be really not fun um, and having to rebuild it is going to be with discrete components is going to be really not fun. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, continue checking here. We know that that one needs to be replaced. This one's a 2-2 two, two with a 2 multiplier. Let's see. Yep, 2.2K. Pretty much dead on. This one's going to be bad. I'm going to replace it regardless, but I'm just curious about it. What do we have? One five. That's open. Look at that shit. 
Oh, no, it's not. Uh, 150. 150 ohms. It's actually fine. It must be only cracked on the outside surface and not all the way through. I still wouldn't trust it just because of the... You know that when this heats up, it's under a lot of stress. Okay, so that's the bias for the output. So the bias resistor for the output is cracked. On this resistor, I, over here, this one that I thought was shorted, I am going to lift one leg of it and test it again just to be sure that it's uh, still testing shorted out of circuit. And no, it's at 50 ohms. If you're in doubt, just clip it out. And then again, you know, you follow it out and you're connected here. So, so that would be why. Yeah, that would be why it's measuring so low resistance because right now the secondary is very low resistance to ground from this center tap. Okay, I can smell the burning electrolytic. All right, so you can see what I've done here. I've just basically um, scored this thing all on the bottom. Okay, so there's what an electrolytic capacitor looks like on the inside. Okay, aha. You can see what I was getting at there. That uh, that has exposed all of our internal leads, and what we will now be able to do is hook up some capacitors to our uh, to our leads here. So we're going to have to run a ground wire up through that center hole, probably right there, and uh, feed our ground through that. But I need I still need to empty this out, so let's let's do this. This is this is nasty. Just nasty. Yeah, this is just no fun at all. I really And I've got one more to do. <laughs> okay, I'm going to forego this idea of emptying this out and reusing this cap because it's just it's just too much work. This stuff is too com um, compact in there, and too much work, too much time I'm wasting. Um, so what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to I'm going to just put the capacitors. Uh, up here in the air like so and I'm just going to shrink tube the hell out of them when I'm done so that if even if you do reach back here uh, you won't be able to touch anything okay
Okay. So those are soldered onto the appropriate terminals. And here's the thing. Uh, this is the positive end that's facing down. The negative end is facing up. Uh, so what we're going to do is tie these two negatives together and we will run a wire from the inside. Okay, so there's the first pair of these installed. I still have this one over here to do. Um, and we're going to shield this. So if you reach back here, there's no way that you could electrocute yourself or anything. Um, but there is the ground wire, the screen wire running up to here, up to the top. And it won't matter because that's going to chassis. So that really doesn't matter. You can touch that all day long. It's not going to hurt anything. Um, what you don't want to touch are these terminals down here on the bottom. So what I'm going to do is just take a bit of... Uh, aluminum shielding tape <clears throat> and I'm just gonna come around the bottom here just kinda start here and just work our way around this is just gonna keep you from being you know just gonna keep you from um, reaching back here and accidentally touching anything So there we go. It's not pretty, but it's uh, it's idiot. It's more idiot proof. <laughs> okay, I got it all, but a little bitty sliver on the back side. I think I can work that off there. Well, there we go. Yeah, that's fine. Wow, look how shriveled up this one is. Look at this. There's even a gap in there. That is that is highly bad. Oh, there we go. That is the inside of a multi-section can capacitor. Okay, so unfortunately trying to get this this substance off of here so that I could find the leads, that I could dig them out. I uh, punctured a hole in this bottom, so I'm going to have to be very careful with this, but I, I think I can work with this. Um, we're going to put one capacitor here, one here. Uh, we'll put a 47, a 47, and then this is a 25 uh, microfarad at 25 volts for the output bypass capacitor. So we'll try to fit all three of these together, and I think it's going to be just fine like this. We're going to be replacing this bypass capacitor that was in the can as well as this resistor. So we may as well take this opportunity to um, just rid ourselves of, of this connection altogether so we won't have to use this terminal. Okay, now this time we should be able to get this right. I'm going to actually replace this can lid and we're going to use some tape on the outside of this can. Okay, so that's on there. I don't think those are going anywhere. Okay, here's the final look at this thing before we fire it up for the first time. Replaced all of the capacitors in it except for these two, which are one microfarad, and they are very well sealed capacitors, so I've left those. Every other one has been replaced, however. Also replaced the bias resistor um, right here with 150 ohm 2 watt. Replaced this capacitor, <coughs> replaced all of the can capacitors in this can and all the can capacitors in the other can as well. And we're now ready to give it a test. All right, we've got this thing plugged into our test speaker over here. Uh, we also have it plugged in right back there to the Variac. And we're going to see what she does. <coughs> And we do have something on the input. I want to see if the crystal cartridge was alive or not. So we can try it. At least. Okay. I'll be damned. Well, it's actually working. But uh, yeah, I think it's I think it's going to be re ready to go. A few other things we're going to have to do to this. Uh, we need to install the Bluetooth device. 
and we have to power that uh, with a 5 volt supply. I'll show you, show you what I, my plan is for that. Okay, it's a new day and uh, back with this thing, doing some work on it. And um, I've, clipped the, I've clipped the power leads off of this old turntable because we're going to have to use this with our new turntable to plug in here. So I'm going to clip the power cord off the new turntable so that we can just plug it into this amplifier here, into the auxiliary plug. And that'll just kind of clean things up. That way you won't have to plug two different things into a, it won't take up two different socket outlets. And also, on this amplifier, there's no fuse. And I just kind of realized that. I was looking at this, I was like, where's the, where's the fuse? And there isn't one. So uh, I'm gonna put an inline fuse, one of these plasticky things <coughs> in here. And also I think I'm gonna go ahead and put a three prong cord on this. I think it's gonna be a good idea because of the, uh, because of the Bluetooth especially, I think I want the grounding to be pretty solid for that reason. Because Bluetooth can be pretty noisy if you don't get the grounding right. And I think having a chassis ground uh, is going to help out with that. Okay, so there's our three-prong cord soldered in. I have it in here with a, uh, with a grommet on the chassis. Uh, holding it in place with a zip tie. And I've tied the end off here. Um, run the ground over to this terminal here. On this side, uh, what I did was <clears throat> there was a wire that was running from this terminal over to the switch right there, and I just clipped that out and cut it shorter and uh, and soldered it to this inline fuse holder. Uh, inside of here is a two amp fuse, which should be plenty to keep this thing going. But if there's a problem, uh, it should blow before anything else does. So. 